So then I'll get into generalized linear models now, uh, which kind of just goes a bit more into what to do if our um, normality assumption is not met, um, particularly in terms of looking at that outcome. And if it is very skewed, then it could just be because it comes from a different distribution rather than the normal distribution. So we can use a generalized linear model if our outcome is not continuous. Um, so the ones that you guys will probably come across most often would be things like your logistic regression, which is for a binary outcome. Um, so like uh, just presence or absence, for example, or alive or dead. Um, then we have binomial regression is kind of a variation of that. So where it's a logistic regression, we have like one trial. So either you're alive or you're dead. Binomial would be if we have multiple trials. So then you can have the number of successes out of the number of trials as our outcome instead. Then we have our count outcome, which is for Poisson regression. And then we also have beta regression, which we won't be getting into together, but I have the code for for you guys, um, which is if you have a proportion that's bounded between zero and one. Um, but on this one, you don't actually know the, the denominator of that proportion. So if we do know the both the numerator and the denominator separately, you can fit a binomial because that provides the model with more information. But if you're just given a column, let's say, with just like the proportions bounded between zero and one, then we don't know the denominator. So we're going to fit a beta regression. Then we can also have categorical outcomes. Um, so just your basic categorical outcome um, where individuals can belong to any number of categories. And then that will be a multinomial regression, which we won't get into. Um, so these do also require different assumptions. Um, but less of them. <laughs> um, so we don't require normality of the residuals anymore here. Um, we don't require constant variance of the residuals because uh, in GLMs, this will naturally be violated. Um, and then we don't assume a linear relationship between the predictors and the outcome directly. But I kind of put stars next to a couple of these because you'll see that we kind of do expect variations of these assumptions. And so just to get into uh, some definitions that we need for generalized linear models, we have our linear predictor, which is just our beta naught plus beta one x1 plus beta two x2. Sometimes you'll see this be um, referred to as eta, which is just our n symbol. Um, so it's just a linear combination of input variables and coefficients. We have our link function, which tells us how our response is linked or related to this linear predictor. So in GLMs, you'll often see that our outcome is going to be denoted E of Y, which is our expected value of Y, or equally, we could just put mu there for the mean. Um, and so the link function G is a function of this mean that links our outcome or our mean to this linear predictor. So that's kind of what defines our generalized linear models. Then each of the generalized linear models also assumes a variance function. So that's how the variance is related to the mean. So just to kind of show you what that looks like, um, in our normal distribution, which was just what we were going over earlier with standard linear models and a continuous outcome, our link function is just the identity function. So that just means that our mu is equal to our linear predictor. So that's just your y equals beta naught plus beta 1 x1, so on then it assumes a variance function of one. And so what that just means is that the variance does not depend on the mean. So they're independent, which is why we were looking for uh, the constant variance of our model residuals there. So in R, that was just fit with the LM function, um, which is what we went over this morning. Then getting into the generalized linear models, we have binomial. So this would be for the binary or number of successes out of multiple trials. So it just depends on how many trials you have. The link function here is called the logit link. So our linear predictor is just going to be equal to log of our outcome divided by 1 minus the outcome. And then we expect that the variance will be equal to mu times 1 minus mu. Um, and so then we would kind of expect the variance to do a little curve. <laughs> and then in R, this is going to be GLM. And then y on x, so still our formula argument, the data, that all stays the same. The thing that will change is that we now have family is equal to binomial. Um, then for Poisson, which is a count outcome, we have the log link. So log of mu is equal to our linear predictor, 
And then in Poisson, we have the strict assumption that the mean is equal to the variance. And then I meant to put there that the family would be equal to Poisson in R. So taking a closer look at each of those, um, logistic regression we use for binary outcomes. So yes, no, present absence, alive, dead, so on. Um, we have P, which would be like our probability of the event occurring is our outcome of interest. So the expected value of Y is equal to mu, we can denote it as, or we can denote it as P in terms of for the logistic regression. So using mu, we can use the logit link. So log of mu over one minus mu is equal to our linear predictor. So that means that when we're fitting our regression, everything's gonna be interpreted in terms of the log odds because the P over one minus P or mu over one minus mu is called the odds of the event happening. So for instance, um, in this case, beta one would tell us the expected increase or decrease in the log odds when we increase X by one unit. And then to get the actual estimated probability out of that, we can just use the inverse logit. Um, so by kind of taking the log over there and um, solving for mu, we end up with e to the linear predictor over one plus e to the linear predictor would be our predicted value of the probability once we have those estimated beta coefficients. For binomial regression, everything is the same, um, except now we have the counts of successes out of a known number of trials. So basically we have a known upper bound on the number of successes that will come become important when we review Poisson regression. And then now we also have an assumption about the variance. So we're gonna assume that the variance is equal to mu times one minus mu. And so we'll be checking that in our um, assumptions as well. And then everything else is the same. So we have the logit link again, which looks like it did previously. And then we can solve for our estimated probability mu hat um, by using the inverse logit. So when I am talking about the fact that the variance is equal to mu times one minus mu, or in other words, P times one minus P is how you might typically see it. Um, it's just saying that given a mean of our binomial distribution, we're gonna expect the variance to kind of follow along this curve here. Um, so if we have no over dispersion, which just means that our mean variance relationship is as assumed by the binomial regression, then you'll kind of see it follow along this red curve here where it will peak at exactly a probability of 0.5 um, with a variance of 0.25 because 0.5 times 0.5 would just be 0.25. Um, but often we might see something called over dispersion, which is when the variance is actually greater than what is expected by the model. So that'd be that blue curve where you can see that at certain points, the variability is greater than what we would have anticipated when fitting the binomial regression. So that's something that we have to look out for when fitting binomial regression models. Then we have the Poisson regression. So this is for abundance or count data. Um, so this is for unbounded number of successes uh, is how you can think of it. So in the binomial, we did have an upper bound, whereas in Poisson, theoretically, we should not have an upper bound on the number of successes. So you can think of this as like the number of car accidents, number of hospital visits, number of bacteria, et cetera, um, where there's no theoretical upper bound on any of those. And then we have the parameter lambda in the Poisson regression. So that is what our mean is going to be that we're modeling. Um, and then again, we have the strict uh, assumption that the variance is equal to the mean. So we'll have mu is equal to E of Y. So again, those are just two equivalent ways of saying the same thing. Um, which is equal to the variance of y. And so we'll use the log link function here. So log of mu hat would be just equal to our linear predictor. So again, when we're interpreting these coefficients, they're gonna be interpreted on the log scale, um, which just means when we're increasing x1 by one unit, we would expect the log um, abundance to increase or decrease by beta one, holding everything else constant. And then if we wanted to get rid of that log and predict just the actual count, not the log of the count, um, then we can just exponentiate our linear predictor. And then you can see that we can get our estimated count given certain values. 
So one thing to note with the Poisson regression is sometimes you will see people fitting a regular linear model to discrete data that might be counts. Um, and that's just because if we have uh, like a common enough event where the counts are very large, then you can see that it does start to resemble the normal distribution. So if we have a rare event, so lambda is equal to one, again, that's the mean of our counts, um, then you can see that it's gonna be very right skewed, but as lambda becomes 10 even, you can see it starts to become more symmetrical. And then as lambda continues to become larger, we see more and more of a symmetrical distribution. And so you kind of can um, start to just use a linear model for those situations and you shouldn't see any violations of your assumption in that case. So that's just one thing to note in case you notice that in the literature ever. Then with the Poisson regression, um, we can also have over dispersed counts. So again, the Poisson regression has that strict assumption that the mean is equal to the variance. Um, but often, especially in biological data, you guys might see something that looks more like the blue line um, where the variance exponentially grows as the mean grows larger. Um, so we'll go over how to handle that as well. And then another thing with the Poisson regression is just the importance of including an offset when necessary. Um, so you kind of have to think, am I modeling a count or am I modeling a rate? Um, so let's say that we were analyzing the number of cows in a field and we had multiple fields as our observations, but some fields were much larger than others, then maybe we instead want to model the number of cows per acre as our rate instead of the number of cows if we expect it to linearly increase with the denominator. So just to show what an offset is, if we were to model the rate with our log links, we'll have log mu, which is our count over m, which is gonna be the number or the exposure, like let's say, so the number of acres, the number of hours, something like that. So we'll have log mu over m is equal to our linear predictor. Using our log rules, we know that mu log of mu over m is just equal to log mu minus log m. So then we set that equal to our linear predictor. Then we can just pull over this log m to our other side so that we have log mu equals the linear predictor plus log m. So you can see all we're doing is adding an extra covariate for the log of our exposure, and we're setting the beta coefficient to one is how you can think of this, and that's what an offset is. And then going over the assumptions quickly. So again, the beauty of generalized linear models is they don't have nearly as many assumptions as the normal um, assumptions for the linear model, uh, but we do still assume linearity, but just between the predictors and the link function. Um, so for example, so for a Poisson model, we wouldn't necessarily expect a linear relationship between the predictors and the count, but we would expect a linear relationship between the predictors and the log of the count. And then we will still assume independence, so nothing's changed there. Um, we assume that we accurately describe the distribution of our data. So for example, for Poisson, we're going to assume um, that the data is a Poisson distribution, so a discrete count, and that the mean is equal to the variance. And so we can do some residual diagnostics to see if we did get the correct distribution. And then we're still going to have our no multicollinearity assumption as well. So for the linearity assumption, um, we can use what's called a component residual plot, which just breaks up our linear regression model after we fit it, or our GLM, sorry, into the residuals um, without the predictor. But basically with these, all you have to pay attention to is you can make the plot for each continuous predictor in your model, and then you just want to see that it is a linear relationship between the x and y axis. So for the right-hand side here, we would see a linear relationship, whereas for the left-hand side, we're seeing that curve again, which means that we might need to include a square term for that particular predictor. So that's how we can check it um, for the GLMs is with these component residual plots. Another way that we can check it would be with um, the deviance residual plots. Um, so we would want to see that there is no pattern in that plot, and we'll be looking at that a bit with the next assumption as well. So with the correct distribution assumption, um, again, we're gonna look at plots of the deviance residuals versus the linear predictor. Before with linear model, we were looking at regular residuals. The deviance residuals have a similar concept, but we have scaled out the variability because again, with something like Poisson, we do not expect constant variance across 
um, our fitted values, we do expect it to actually increase with your fitted values. Um, and so we have to scale that out, which is what gives us the deviance residuals. So once we plot the deviance residuals versus the linear predictor, we do expect to see a constant variability with no patterns if we did get that correct distribution and if we have the linearity assumption met as well. And so if the assumption is not met, we can try adding variables to the model to see if that explains some of the extra variability that was not accounted for. Um, we can see if we need to potentially transform any of our pre predictor variables or we can try out alternative GLMs if we think another one might be more appropriate. So are there any questions about any of that before we get into the part two of the lab? Uh, 